everybody. Woo, hallelujah. How many are excited to be in church on Sunday afternoon? Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. It is a treat to be here today and uh, to see all of your smiling faces. Amen. Most importantly, I'm glad Jesus is in the house today. Amen. How many know the word of the Lord is true today? Wherever folks are gathered together in his name, he promised he would be there. So I'm glad that the Lord is here today. Amen. Thank the Lord. Stand with me if you will. I know uh, you guys have had a long day already, most of you. And uh, we already did a service today and, and then hit the road and beat it to get up here on time, but we're very thankful to be here, and so uh, we'll just stand for a second to get some blood flowing and make sure everybody's awake. Is that all right? Amen. Turn around to your neighbor, look him in the face, tell him you look good. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Now some of you just fib right there. It's okay. We'll pray through when we get done. It's all right. Amen. I want you to help me sing a little song today. This has been around a long time. I don't know if you know it. Uh, if you don't, you're about to learn it. Are we ready in the back there? There we go. Now we're ready. Help me sing this if you know it. Anybody ask you who I am, who I am, who I am. If anybody asks who I am, tell them, child of God. Well, if anybody asks who I am, who I am, who I am, anybody ask who I am, tell them, child of God. My father is rich, houses and land, he holds the wealth of the world, his hand, rubies and diamonds, silver and gold, tell him I'm a child of God. If anybody ask who I am, who I am, who I am, if anybody ask who I am, tell him, child of God. Oh, if anybody ask who I am, who I am, who I am, if anybody ask who I am, tell him, child of God. Come on, clap your hands. Give the Lord praise today. What a great God we serve. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I feel his presence in the house. Somebody give him glory today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Amen, amen. You may be seated for just a moment. I need to share just a couple of things with you very quickly. And then uh, we are going to get into a little bit of a lesson here today. Uh, just quickly, how many of you have ever heard of Micronesia? I see, wow, several hands. Those of you that have not, I promise it is not a disease. It really is a place. How many have heard of the island of Guam? Most of us have heard of Guam. We base on the island of Guam, and uh, our field uh, is actually made up of five different countries and uh, spreads out all across the Pacific Ocean. We cover an area that's actually a little bit bigger than the size of the entire United States, a little about, right at about 3.2 million square miles. And uh, the exciting part about all that is the Lord's pouring out the Holy Ghost in the Pacific. Amen. Thank the Lord. I've received several reports from our pastors, even during the middle of all this COVID nonsense, that people are still receiving the Holy Ghost and being baptized in Jesus' name in spite of COVID. Amen. How many know you can still get the Holy Ghost in spite of problems? Amen. Thank the Lord. But uh, very quickly today, we need your help. Uh, and I do want to say a big thank you to this church for your faithful support over many years. 
Uh, we couldn't do what we do without folks like you that support us monthly. Uh, but we do have a very special need that I want to share with you today. Because of the cost of travel in our part of the world, uh, of course, being uh, the, all of the countries we serve are all island nations, and uh, <clears throat> we have to fly to get there. No boat service, unfortunately. And uh, so we have to fly to get there, and uh, it is just very, very expensive to do that. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, our closest island is the island of Saipan. Some of you may remember that from your World War II history. Uh, about 100 miles to the north of us, on an average day, it takes us about 30 minutes to fly there. Uh, when the wind is blowing right, of course, we're flying a little pl uh, propeller plane, and if the wind is blowing right, we can make it about 20 minutes. But that little, short little flight, 30-minute flight, cost us right at $500 per person just to get there. I am praying desperately that Southwest Airlines will decide to come to my part of the world and we get some of those $49 flights. Amen. But uh, very, very expensive. And uh, so, consequently, we have to raise uh, an additional amount besides our partners uh, of $100,000 to help us cost our, uh, cover the cost of our airfare over a four-year period. Now, I am guessing by the look on two or three of y'all's faces that probably two or three of you have $100,000, and you came this afternoon with uh, the desire just to share. Hallelujah. And uh, so uh, if, if you're here and you'd like to share, I'd love to talk to you. Amen. Probably your pastor would like to talk to you as well. He'd want to know where you got it from. Amen. But uh, seriously, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we are in, I think we figured out in our 22nd or 23rd service, I think it is, since we started our deputation in March. And some of y'all are saying, wow, you go to church a lot. Actually... We should be at about 100, 110, 120 by this point. COVID's got everything all messed up, and so uh, we're a little bit behind. But the good news is that we've already raised about $50,000 of that $100,000. Amen. Thank the Lord. And so I'm going to let you off easy. If you came to give 100000 we only need half of it. So, I mean, hallelujah. Uh, but we, we do it a little bit differently. We just raise it in a little bitty pieces. And uh, if you'd like to help us with $100, we'll swap you $100 for one of these nice little cards right here. Very simple, very straightforward. It just says, I gave, they'll go. Pretty simple. What we do is we take your $100, put it with somebody else's $100. By the time we are done, we always have exactly what we need. How many know the Lord is faithful? He is faithful. Amen. And so if you'd like to help us with that, uh, please see us after the service. We've got a little table set up there in the foyer. I know the Lord will bless you for whatever you can do. Now, uh, very quickly, and then I'm going to get into our lesson today, uh, but I need to ask this, and I'm going to do this very delicately. I don't want to offend anybody here today, and so I'm going to choose my words very carefully. Is there anybody here uh, that... Uh, could say, uh, along with me, uh, that could say that uh, during this whole COVID craziness that you have, uh, you, you have acquired uh, a couple of extra pounds. I, uh, <clears throat> I had a pastor friend of mine call me several weeks ago, and he said, bro, he said, he said I'm getting a sunburn from the light in the refrigerator. I mean, what else do you do when you're shut down? You just eat, right? So if, you've, if you have acquired a couple of extra pounds during this COVID thing, this little thing right here is the absolute best, 100% guaranteed way to help you lose weight. Now, if I didn't have anybody's attention before, I know I've got it now. Here's how it works. If you'll help us with $100, uh, my wife has already prepared some of these cards and put a magnet on the back. All right, so you help us with $100. We're going to give you this card. You take it home and put it on the front of your refrigerator. All right, 
Everybody with me so far? So those of you that can't see it down here in the corner, there's a picture there of my wife and I, all right? So you help us with $100. We're going to give you the card. You take it home, put it on the front of your refrigerator. That way, every time you head to the fridge, you will see my unmasked face looking at you. It will cause you to turn and run from the refrigerator thereby getting some exercise and losing a couple of pounds. I promise it works. Amen. Seriously, if you'd like to help us with that, just talk to us after church. Aren't you glad we can have fun in church? Amen. Amen. Come on, clap your hands again. Give the Lord praise. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Stand with me once again. If you would, open your Bibles to the 139th Psalm. And uh, I'm going to try to do this quickly today. I know you all have had a busy day already. And so we're going to do this quickly and uh, hopefully get you out early. Woo! Everybody said hallelujah. That's the greatest gift you can ever give your audience is to let them out early. Amen. I normally would read the entire uh, psalm, but for the sake of time, we're going to start with verse number 13. If you have it in your Bible, say praise the Lord. If you're still looking, say, wait a minute. I don't hear pages turning, nor wait a minute. So we'll move on. Those of you that don't have your Bible, it's on the screen. How many are thankful that we have technology? But How many know you still need to have a Bible? Is that okay? Amen. Psalm 139, beginning with verse number 13. Let's read it together out loud. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. The Living Bible translates it this way, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. It's amazing to think about. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. Amen. The average size adult A human is made up of 37.2 trillion cells, 100 billion neurons, 90,000 miles of nerve fiber, 100,000 miles of blood vessels, all beginning from a single cell smaller than the head of a pin. Everything that you would develop into was already pre-programmed into you. Your hair color, your eye color, your abilities, your deficiencies all pre-programmed into that single cell, we are indeed uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Would you clap your hands and give the Lord praise? Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. For just a few minutes today, I want to talk to you on this subject. I am somebody. Amen. Would you just say that out loud? I am somebody. Say it like you mean it. I am somebody. Clap your hands one more time. Give the Lord praise. I love you, Jesus. You may be seated in Jesus' name. How many of you have ever heard of Popeye? Amen. Popeye is a fictional cartoon character created by Elsie Chrysler Siegel. It was first created and published as a comic strip for King Features Thimble Theater on January 29, 19 and 29. That's a few days before my time. Amen. 19 and 33, Max Fleischer took the comic strip character and produced a cartoon series for Paramount Pictures called Popeye the Sailor Man. The cartoon uh, became very popular, continued to be produced until 1957. 2002, Popeye was rated 20th in the 50 all-time best cartoon characters. Popeye was famous for his adages or his sayings. Some of them, some of you some of you may remember some of them, but some of the more notable sayings are, well, blow me down. Or that's all I can stand because I can't stand no more. 
or this one, I'm strong to the finish because I eat my spinach. Amen. One of Popeye's most famous lines was, I am what I am, and that's all I am. Amen. Of course, the way he said it in the cartoon was, I am what I am, and that's all I am. Amen. What Popeye was saying was that this is what I am. There is no pretense. There is no innuendo. There is no hidden agenda. Amen. The very first words ever spoken by the character Popeye were in response to a question from the character Castor Oil where he said, Hey there, are you a sailor? And his response was, Do you think I'm a cowboy? I am what I am, and that's all I am. There's no trick. There's no sham. There's no deception. I'm Popeye the sailor, man. What you see is what you get. Amen. Although Popeye, the cartoon character, very obviously did not suffer from an identity crisis, uh, nor did he suffer from a lack of self-esteem, we, on the other hand, as humans, more specifically, we as apostolics, often suffer with an identity crisis and wonder who and what we are and where we fit in. How many of you here uh, this afternoon were raised in church? By that I mean you, your entire life, or, or at least from the time you were one or two years old, you've been in church your, your whole life. Let me see your hand. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Uh, how many of you then were raised in another religious belief system or with no religion at all? Amen. Anybody care to just shout out where you came from? What were you before you came to be an apostolic? Nothing. Catholic. Anything else? I'm sorry? Roman. Well, we're getting serious here. Not just Catholic. We are Roman Catholic. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Identity issues affect all of us. For those raised in the church, some of you might think you have a leg up or an advantage because of your upbringing. And while there is some truth to that statement in regards to having a better understanding of apostolic traditions and uh, biblical practices and principles, there are still issues that you, uh, as what some would call inborn apostolics, there are issues that you have to, had to, and have to face. Amen. Just because you had a clear understanding of Noah and the ark and Daniel in the lion's den and David and Goliath doesn't mean that you didn't have some issues you had to face in identifying who and what you are. For those who are raised in other religious belief systems, your identity issues upon becoming an apostolic may have been more abrupt and severe simply because of the fact that often coming into truth is a rapid change. Amen. Many times someone making a move into an apostolic lifestyle happens in one service. Somebody invites you to come to church and you, or you feel the Lord drawing you and you show up without invitation and in one service, amen, you are touched by the power of the Lord and your life is completely turned upside down and inside out, amen. While there are some who gradually make the move from other religious beliefs into truth, and while uh, their transition is more gradual, it's a more uh, easy transition, if you will, it is a transition nonetheless. When the commitment is finally made to embrace the apostolic lifestyle, a change takes place and identities are challenged. However, regardless of what your upbringing was, whether you were raised in this truth or just stumbled in uh, out of desperation, I I need to make this point very, very clear today. Wherever you came from, all of us had to come the same way. Amen. Being raised in the church doesn't give you a pass on the requirements. Being raised in a completely godless household does not make the requirements more stringent or severe. The fact of the matter is we were all born in a sinful condition. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and just look at him. Tell him, I'm just like you. Amen. 
It really doesn't matter what your name is, what your daddy did, where he came from, or what your background was. We were all in the same place. David said it best. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We were all the same. Every one of us had to come through repentance. Every one of us had to come through baptism in Jesus' name. Every one of us had to come through receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And if you came any other way, you're a thief and a robber. Amen. Don't get mad at me. That's what Jesus said. He said, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. We all came the same way. I'm so thankful there aren't two or three different ways to get salvation. Amen. Not only are we oneness in our belief in one God, but we're oneness in believing there's only one way that you can make it to salvation. Amen. I remember singing it as just a boy, brother and sister Hart. We used to sing it. One, one, one. One way to God. One, one, one. One way to God. One, one, one. One way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. And we started getting real excited. We'd sing it this way. Filled with the Holy Ghost. One way to God. Anybody remember that? And we get real excited about that. But I'm so thankful that there is only one way, and we know the way. Amen. Amen. Come on, clap your hands and praise him. Because of this identity thing, while growing up, there were two of me. Now, don't anybody get nervous. I am not now, nor was I then, a psychopath. There, there may be debate. The jury may be out on, for some. Uh, but uh, I think you'll understand and identify with what I'm saying here in just a minute. In the world of psychi- psychiatry and psychology, there is a medical condition known as DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, formerly known as Multiple Personality Disorder. Without getting too technical, because if I get too technical, I'll lose myself. Amen. But DID, or Dissociative Identity Disorder, is a mental illness characterized by at least two distinct and relatively enduring personality states. The phrase identity crisis was coined by one Eric Homburger Erickson. Now you talk about having an identity crisis. How'd you like to be called Eric Hamburger? I mean Homburger. See what I mean? Erickson was a German-American developmental psychologist and psychoanalyst known for his theory uh, on psychological development of human beings. According to Erickson, the identity crisis is one of, if not the most important crisis or issue we must face in our development. Erickson believed that an identity crisis is a time of intensive analysis and exploration of different ways of looking at oneself. Stick with me here for just a minute. Amen. As a young boy growing up, and forgive the personal reference, but I figured I'd pick on myself instead of embarrassing somebody else. Amen. But as a young boy growing up, I struggled with who I was because of my apostolic heritage. Even if you were not raised in this truth, you'll still be able to identify with what I'm saying based on uh, your life after you came into truth. Amen. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like, in fact, I was two separate people. Now, y'all are looking at me like I'm, I just turned blue and I've you know, got things sticking out of my head here. Stay with me. I was, the Lord blessed me, and I was, uh, I don't want to use the word gifted, but I was, I was blessed to be able to play sports when I was younger. Matter of fact, I played with some of y'all in this room here today. Amen. But I was blessed to be able to play sports. Baseball and softball was my game of choice growing up here in the Northeast. 
uh, as you well know, we can't play softball year-round. Amen. I hated that, but we couldn't do it. So during the cold months, we'd play football. Amen. I was always a little skinny kid growing up. And uh, playing football was a challenge for me, but I excelled at it nonetheless. I I was not called by my name uh, around the guys that we would play ball with. I was known, and this is going to be news for my niece here today, I was known as Little D. My older brother, who by the time he was, and I'm sure all of you know my, my oldest brother, Fred, by the time he was 14, 15 years old, he was already 6'2", 180 pounds, and a very gifted, gifted football player. Now, some of you may not know this, but in his senior year of high school, he was recruited by several colleges uh, with offers to play college with the intent of going pro. I like to remind him he probably never would have made it, but... I mean, that's a little brother talking to his older brother, right? But he was big D. Because of my size, I was little D. And actually, he became big D, not because of his size, but because I was little D, he had to be big D. Most of the guys that we played football with were my brother's size. The reason they let me play was often because they liked to use me as the football. The reason I excelled at football was because of two things. Number one, I could run like a deer. And number two, I had absolutely no fear. I would block anybody, I'd hit anybody, I'd run over anybody, I'd just give me the ball and let me go. It doesn't matter how big they were, I was going to go at them. I recall playing with a group of guys one Sunday afternoon. This was back in the early days when, you know, we had church in the morning and we'd have a break in the afternoon and we'd always play ball and then we'd have church at night. Amen. But we were playing ball on this Sunday afternoon and a bunch of guys met at the uh, Bristol Central High School and we were playing on their field there and uh, a bunch of big Big guys, all my brother's size, and, and uh, we were playing ball. We started to play. My, my brother told me, he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, you two guys open up a hole. I'm going to give the ball to my little brother, and he's going to run. And so here we go. We started to play. The guys opened up a nice hole, and I got the ball, and I took off running as hard as I can. The only problem was as soon as I hit the line of scrimmage, there was another guy that stepped in the way that was about 150 pounds heavy heavier than I was, knocked me flat on the ground, knocked me out cold. I was literally unconscious laying on the ground. And just, you know, just to let you know how much they cared about me, they, uh, they, they picked me up off of the field, carried me over to the side, dumped me like a sack of potatoes, and went back to play ball. Amen. But around these guys, even though they were bigger than I was, I understood who I was. We were all church guys. I had respect among them. Even though I was young, I had respect among them because they all knew I could play a little ball, especially on the softball field. When it came time to pick up teams, I was always among the first to be chosen. I fit in. But in school, it was a different story. I was... The weird kid. Because of our apostolic standard of dress, I I didn't have long hair like all the other kids, and I didn't wear bell-bottom jeans. I know that's dating me a little bit there, but it's okay. I didn't wear bell-bottom jeans, and I didn't go outside at lunchtime and smoke. I didn't go in the bathroom in between classes and smoke a joint like the other kids. I was the weird kid. When it came time for gym class, nobody, this is true, nobody wanted me on their team because I was the weird kid. And they all thought because I was the weird kid, I couldn't play ball. 
Some of you have grown up in church and can identify with what I have dealt with as a young man because you felt the same exact things. Those who did not grow up in church can identify with what I'm saying because as you started making changes in your life, the changes that you made that aligned you with this apostolic lifestyle created a separation between you and the people you used to hang out with and and an identity crisis developed. Amen. Let me just throw this in for good measure here today. If when you came to the Lord, nothing changed in your lifestyle, nothing changed in the way you dressed or the way you acted, nothing changed in the relationship you had with your old old homies, you either didn't get the Holy Ghost or really need to pray through and get it again. Amen. Paul said that when we come to Jesus, we are new creatures. Old things are passed away. Behold, everything is made new. Things change when the Holy Ghost comes in. Gideon is such a classic biblical example of an identity crisis. He was an Israelite. He was a child of God. He was a member of the chosen people of Jehovah. He was supposed to be part of the victorious force that conquered the promised land. And when he is first introduced into the pages of Holy Writ, he is hiding behind a wine press, trying to eke out a living while being uh, without being detected by the the Midianites. There he is trying to thresh wheat. Amen. Threshing wheat is a process of separating the edible part from the inedible part. They would take the wheat and throw it up into the air, and the wind would catch the chaff, which was lighter than the grain, and the chaff would blow away, and the grain would fall to the ground. So there he is trying to get enough wheat gathered to feed his family. All the while he's threshing wheat, he's looking over his shoulder, wondering if the Midianites are going to come. Come, and all of I, I, he thought he was all by himself, and in the middle of all that, somebody speaks out to him and says, "The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor." thinking he's alone and then hearing a voice. You can imagine the reaction no doubt scared the living daylights out of him. Amen. Because of his identity crisis, Gideon responds and here's what the word says. Amen. Gideon said, uh, or or rather Judges chapter 13, he responds to this uh, person that shows up and he says, oh my Lord. Now, a lot of people read that and, you know, you just kind of skim over and said, and Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why? But that's not how it happened. you got to use your imagination just a little bit. He's all by himself. He thinks nobody's there. He thinks he's hidden out from the entire world. And all of a sudden, somebody speaks out, Hey, you're a mighty man of valor. Oh, my Lord. If the Lord be with us, why then? Is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. The angel again tries to get him to realize who he was and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And Gideon's identity crisis-ridden mind responded by saying, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall uh, I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Here's the angel of the Lord. Some think that this was, in fact, a theophany. The Lord himself appearing in the form of an angel, speaking directly to Gideon and telling him that he is a mighty man of valor. You're a powerful warrior that has potential to destroy the oppressors of Israel, a man that is capable of demolishing the enemy, capable of obliterating the very people, causing him to sneak around and hide for his life, but because he's suffering from an identity identity crisis and didn't understand who he was. He said, I'm the least in my father's house. 
I'm a nobody from nowhere, and I'm the worst in my father's house. Amen. I want to share with you three things very quickly today, three things that help us realize our position and potential in Jesus. I am somebody. Everybody say, I am somebody. I am somebody because of who I am. Genesis chapter 1 tells us of the beginning of the earth as we know it today. Great debate as to whether or not there were dinosaurs, whether they lived on the earth. Uh, If so, when did they live on the earth? Uh, If they did exist, what happened to them? The great debate about how old the earth actually is. It is indeed possible that the earth is actually millions, maybe even billions of years old. It's possible that there were dinosaurs that lived on the earth. I'm not qualified nor capable to answer those questions. It really doesn't matter to me. Amen. Uh, What I can say is that the earth as we know it today is some 6,000 years old. If you want to believe it's millions and billions of years, great. If you want to believe there's dinosaurs, great. If you've got an explanation for all that, wonderful. I'd love to hear it sometime, just not today. Amen. But uh, none of that has any impact on my salvation or where I'm going when Jesus comes, so I'm not going to debate it with anybody. Amen. What I do know is that Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning, in the beginning of time as we know it, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water and God said, everybody say God said. God said, let there be light, and there was. Amen. God spoke everything that we know today into existence. He spoke the sun and moon into existence. He spoke the stars and planets into existence. He spoke uh, the fish of the sea into existence. He spoke the animals into existence. He spoke plant life into existence. As beautiful and perfect and delicious as strawberries are. Sister Hart made a, a punch for us years and years ago. Some kind of strawberry rhubarb. What was it? No, let's not go that far, but some kind of, some kind, I mean, it was, I mean, strawberry. I mean, just think about it. They're shaped perfectly. They're designed wonderfully. They taste amazing. But even all of that, God spoke that into existence. But when it came time for you and I, When it came time for man, God came down and knelt on the ground and with his hands in the dust of the earth, he created man. Because there was no better design for man than God himself. He created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. I am somebody because I'm created in the very image of God. David said, for thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I'll praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee in the lowest part, or when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in contempt Continuous were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. The Lord spoke to the prophet Jeremiah and said, uh, before, I, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I should send thee. And what? Whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. 
I'm somebody because God created me in his image. I'm somebody because his hand is on me. I'm somebody because God is with me. I am somebody because God doesn't make junk. Oh, I wish you'd clap your hands and give the Lord praise. Hallelujah, I am somebody because of what I cost. Because of what I cost. Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, he said, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. What is a soul worth? The message here that is if you gain all the wealth and riches of the entire world, if you can amass riches beyond compare, live in the lap of luxury in this world, but lose your soul. Amen. The word that Jesus used here for soul is suke, breath, soul, spirit. Jesus is talking about the real you, the part of you that will live on for eternity. What would you give in exchange for that part of you, your eternal soul? Can I tell you that Jesus thought enough about you? Amen. That uh, he thought enough about the real you, amen, that he identified himself as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, before the world was formed, before God said let there be, before he breathed into a lump of clay and called it Adam, and before Adam became a living soul, he already determined that he would come and pay the ultimate price and give himself for the sins of every man. Amen. He thought enough of you that he gave his own life. Paul brings it home and makes it so clear when he says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, He died for you. Somebody ought to just close your eyes right now and just thank Him right now. You ought to just thank Him right now. Because while you were unlovable, He came where you were and loved you anyways. Before you ever came on the scene, he thought enough of you to give himself as a sacrifice. Hallelujah. I'm not on an ego trip. I'm nothing on my own. I make mistakes. I often slip. Just common flesh and bone But someday I'll prove Just what I say I'm of a special kind You remember it? When he was on the cross I was on his mind The look of love was on his face, thorns on his head. The blood that stained his scarlet robe, stained it crimson red. Though his eyes were on the crowd that day. He looked ahead in time For when he was on the cross You and I were on 
his mind. Come on, sing it if you know it. Well, he knew me, and yet he loved me. One more time, would you? He knew me. Oh, and yet he loved me. Well, he whose glory made the heavens shine. I was so unworthy. So mercy oh but when he was on oh I was I was I I'm so unworthy of such mercy was on the cross oh, I come on lift your hands and give him praise right now would you give him praise I'm somebody I'm somebody I'm somebody I'm somebody I'm somebody I am somebody because of what I cost, I'm somebody. He thought about you way back when he was on the cross and realized you would need a Savior. I am somebody today. Somebody ought to raise a shout of praise in the house right now. You ought to raise a shout of praise in the house right now. I'm somebody. I'm somebody. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. You can be seated. Number three, I am somebody because of what I can become. Because of the Holy Ghost in you, the possibilities become limitless as to what you can become. You say, oh, those are nice words, preacher. That sounds really good, but it is not really, really true after all. I mean, come on, really. I'm sorry you feel that way. I happen to believe that because of who I am and because of what I cost that I can indeed become and achieve in this life. Amen. King David gave three conditions uh, for achieving and becoming someone great in God's eyes. He said in Psalms 37 and 3, Try Trust in the Lord and do good, and so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Amen. I'm reminded of an old, old song. If you just put your trust in him, although the pathway may seem dim, after the storm has passed over, everything will be all right. Amen. David saying that if you'll trust him, you will have all of your needs met. I wish somebody helped me and say amen. He'll take care of you if you trust him. Amen. Psalms 37 and 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The word delight here means to take pleasure in. Amen. Take pleasure in the Lord. It's not about being forced to live for God. 
Amen. I have to do this because I'm an apostolic. I have to dress the way I dress because I'm apostolic. No, no, no. It's not about being forced. It's about saying, I'm so excited. I'm a born-again, heaven-bound, apostolic believer. I'm glad I get to do what I do. I'm glad I get to dress like I dress. I'm excited to live for Jesus. I take pleasure in my lifestyle. When you delight yourself in living for Jesus, He will give you the desires of your heart because what you want is important to Him. Well, I wish I'd get about three people to help me believe that right there. What's important to you and what you want is important to Jesus Christ. Amen. Psalms 37 and 5, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. David is saying that if you trust in him, he'll provide for you. If you delight in him, the sky is the limit on what you can become. If you commit to him, he will bring the desires of your heart to pass. Amen. Moses went from being a washed up shepherd to being the leader of a great nation because he trusted the Lord. Gideon went from a cowardly farmer to the champion of Israel because he trusted the Lord. Peter went from being a spiritual wimp, afraid of a young girl, to being a, a spiritual giant standing on the day of Pentecost and declaring this message for the first time because he trusted in the Lord. You are somebody today. You are somebody today. The hand of the Lord is on you today. There are great preachers in this room. There are great pastors in this room. There are great pastors' wives in this room. There are anointed musicians here. Great Bible study teachers. I am somebody. I'm somebody. Stand with me, would you? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and look him in the face and tell him I'm somebody. So you see, some of you still don't act like you mean that. I'm somebody. I am somebody. I'm somebody important. Amen. Half the world may not know my name, but I'm somebody important because of who I am. Amen. Help me sing real quick. If anybody asks you who I am, who I am, who I am, anybody ask who I am, tell them, child of God. Hey, hey, if anybody asks who I am, who I am, who I am, if anybody asks who I am, tell them, well, my father is rich, houses and land. He holds the world, palm of his hand. Rubies and diamonds, silver and gold. Tell him, I'm a child of God. Oh, yes, if anybody asks who I am, who I am, who I am. Anybody ask who I am. Tell him I'm a child of God. Come on, clap your hands. Give the Lord praise. You're somebody today. You're somebody. You are somebody. I wish you'd get excited about that. I'm an apostolic born again, Holy Ghost believer.